You have been hearing me speak for several months now about being unstoppable, the unstoppable church, and you've been hearing me for a couple of years talk about being on mission. And maybe some of you are thinking, yeah, 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 that uh, being on mission. Um, I know that's important, but you have to understand my life is really, really, really busy. It's just hard to fit mission in. And mission has obstacles, and mission is hard, and uh, we, get, it, we have to work through all of that. And I'd love to just talk with you this morning for a few minutes just about mission. And if you have your Bibles, join me in the 21st chapter of Acts, Acts 21. The Apostle Paul is winding down the third missionary journey, and he's heading back to Jerusalem. The difficulty is that going back to Jerusalem, he knows that he's going to be arrested, uh, uh, beaten, afflicted, and it's going to be the beginning of the end as he then is headed off to Rome. He knows that. And so in the 20th chapter, there's this very emotional uh, departure where he's leaving the Ephesian elders and he shares with them those very important words and then they hug and they kiss and then he pulls away from them to go to continue the mission. We find to, to be on mission, we have to first understand what mission is. And then secondly, we have to overcome the obstacles that will come with mission. And third, we have to do and be whatever God calls us to do and to be in mission. Let's look at them one at a time. First of all, we have to understand mission. Notice chapter 1, verses 21, or chapter 21, verse 1. And when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kaz, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it by on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. You say, what do those verses have to do with being on mission? I find that everything in the book of Acts is driven by one verse. Everything in the life of Peter in those early chapters and the apostles was driven by one verse. And everything in the life of Paul was driven by one verse. And guess what, folks? Everything in our lives should be driven by one verse. And that's the verse, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, where Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. The wording there is, is powerful, and it's, it's, it's a word of commission, and it's a word of empowerment, and it's a word where he's saying, you will, you will be my witnesses. Well, if that's the case, we, if we are his witnesses, and it's not a, a, an optional thing, if this mission you choose to accept, no, we want, we are his witnesses. Then the only remaining question is, what kind of witnesses will we be? To understand mission, to see what drives us in mission. And Paul, what was driving Paul was this mission. Notice in verse number one, it said, when we had parted. The word there in the original language means to tear oneself away. Paul was tearing himself away from the emotion, from the security, from the comfort, and from the bonds of love he had with those Ephesian elders, those people. It would have been wonderful for him to stay there, and they could have had Bible studies in neighborhood groups for the rest of their lives and uh, told the stories and shared their stories of what God had done. But God had given him a mission that involved Jerusalem and later on Rome. Sometimes being on mission involves leaving our comfort zones, leaving the shelters, and leaving the security. My wife and I officially went on mission for God together almost 40 years ago. And in these 40 years of service, um, all but a year and a half have been served at least 700 miles away from both sets of families. We didn't realize until we had kids the sacrifice that our parents had made way back then. So when our children were born, uh, my parents weren't there and Carolyn's parents weren't there. And oftentimes because of the dis distance, we didn't see them uh, maybe once a year. But some of you on mission have sent your children to China where they're working today serving Christ or Japan 
Some of your sons and daughters are in Afghanistan and Iraq on mission. You should know, wait a minute, there are soldiers there. If they're believers, they're on mission. We'll get to that in a moment. We're all on mission. One of our families has a, a daughter and a son-in-law that they sent on mission to Rome where they're working hard to make a difference for Christ. That same family has sent their son in, their, in his probably mid-20s now uh, by himself to uh, one of the poorest sections of India where he's on mission trying to make a difference for Jesus Christ. To be on mission involves leaving the comfort zones. I had the opportunity on Friday night to be at a neighborhood group that was made up of young couples from this campus and also some from the Detroit campus. And I met a young couple named Ricky and Kim. Ricky and Kim lived in Atlanta. They didn't know anybody in Detroit and yet they had a burden for Detroit. You have people from Detroit wanting to move to places like Atlanta. Ricky and Kim were being moved by God to leave their comfort zone and shelter and security and families in Atlanta and move to Detroit because people there needed Jesus. And God was sending them on mission. They went online and found that Woodside Bible had a campus in Detroit and they moved and joined that campus and joined the mission of reaching people in the city of Detroit with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To leave our comfort zones, Abdu Murray, his wife Nicole, uh, good friends of mine. Abdu uh, was raised in uh, an Islamic family and came to know Jesus after nine years of studying Christianity and Islam side by side. And then for years worked in, in a Muslim evangelism while he's a, a partner in a prestigious law firm in the Detroit area. And then in December, he resigned the law firm officially and went full-time, launched out to be on mission. What causes people to do that? It's the understanding of the mission. It's the understanding that we are all, Acts 1-8, sent out and we are witnesses. Let me, let me draw something out for you this morning and uh, just uh, think about this together because I think, I think we, we embrace some myths. One of the myths that I think we embrace is this one, who I started off with, and that is mission is something that's really important and I need to fit it somehow into my already busy life. Okay, can you resonate with that? Don't accept it. But so many of us have, haven't we? It's important. So what we end up with is something like this, where we say, maybe we're... Some of you had no idea I had seventh grade art three times. <laughs> so we make the decisions as we launch out into adult life that we are going to be a carpenter, a scientist, a, a builder, a teacher, um, a plumber, an electrician, an engineer. And we, that's what we do. And that's what consumes us. And before long, what we do determines our identity, and that's what we become, unfortunately. And yet we all look forward to this thing at the end of it called? Starts with an R. <laughs> Retirement. And then you come to Woodside Bible, and you get some guy saying, you need to get involved in mission. And neighborhood groups are a good way to do it. And so we get involved in neighborhood groups when they fit in. Once a month, once a week, once every other week. Ours is tonight. And then you look for opportunities to be on mission to share Jesus during a course of a very, very, very busy life. May I suggest there's a better way? And that way is To understand that mission isn't something that we fit in to an already busy life. Mission is life. It is life. It was for Paul, it was for Peter, it was for the apostles. It must be for us. It is life. When the apostle Paul wrote to the Colossian believers, he said to them, when Christ, and then you have 
commas, and between those two, com two commas, you have this little appositional expression where it says, and Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Who is our life? We're on mission. And so our lives then become opportunities for mission to be fleshed out. It's in our neighborhood group. It's in, it's in our business. It's in our, our hobbies. It's in our, our eating. We go out to eat. It's there. It's, it's whatever we do. We're on mission to serve and to speak for Jesus Christ. We've, uh, we're building a pole barn at our house. It's 24 by 32. And so um, we uh, they hired a company from Midland who does pole barns. And so they, they sent a two-man crew to do the pole barn. Okay? So I'm pretty, pretty pumped about this pole barn. And so they start. Now their job is, these two guys, is to do what? Yeah, the question's going to get harder now, folks. Okay. <laughs> They're pole barn builders, so these two guys, their job is to build a pole barn. Okay. And my job is to pay them? Trick question. My job is to live on mission. So it's going to get challenged a little bit. And to live on mission, then we all, I always have to ask the question. Now, I have, to, I have to represent and be Jesus Christ to them. Even when the pole barn is two and a half months past construction deadline. So what do you do? Well, how would Jesus handle this? And I found myself, when they would text me in a snowy day from Midland, and say, um, doesn't look like a good day for work. I'd find myself texting him back and said, I don't blame you. I wouldn't want to be out in this either. Stay home. And what does it matter if it's done early or done late? And I know what some of you are thinking. Wait a minute, you've got to separate business and you've got to separate mission. I think that's the problem we've gotten into as a church, at churches. You can't, because mission is life, because Christ is life. The second problem I faced, my responsibility to be on mission, is that in order to be on mission, you have to have contact. And they're coming down from Midland, and they're arriving after I leave to come to work, and they're back in Midland before I get home. So it was on Mondays, normally my day off, I got to connect with these two guys in their 30s. And what I found is that I just asked questions. Ask them about their lives, ask them about their challenges, ask them what they were facing, ask them about pole barn building. And tried to get into their world and listened a lot. Shared what I could of faith, but then... And then they texted me and said, uh, or called, I think, and said, uh, we're hoping to finish our part of the pole barn on Friday, which was this past Friday. Any chance you could be there to give us a check? Unfortunately, I was busy Friday. <laughs> Not really. So I said, sure. And I went, went home. And we, we looked at the pole barn, and I admired it. And... Um, we talked about how hard it was and in the cold weather and how a lot of guys, when they did pole barns, didn't, they don't do mitered corners. These guys did. They took their time. I was so pleased. And so then the, the next challenge of living on mission is to say, I owe you um, $1,100. So I... I stopped at the bank before and I got 200 extra dollars so I could give them cash because I wanted to say thank you. And the more we talked as we're talking, don't you hate it sometimes when the Holy Spirit says, can I rip that check up and write him a bigger one? So I did. Then I gave him the extra money. 
And then I said, you know, you guys did a great job as pole barn builders. I'm so pleased. And um, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I'm a pastor, and, and one of the things I can give you is uh, what, I, what I do a lot is try to connect people in God. And what you've shared with me, you're going, both of you are going through some tough things, and you need Jesus. And um, I said, I've, I've seen him change my life. I know, he can, I, can, I know he can change yours so completely. And I said, you've got my, my numbers. Call me. If there's anything I can ever do, call me, night or day, call me. And one of them said, you know, I'm going to take you up on that. And as I thought about it later, I made a huge mistake in that presentation. I made the appeal based on being a pastor, which they could have included. Well, that's what he's supposed to do. That's his job. And I made the same mistake of flipping this thing upside down, where being on mission is who we are. It's not what we do. And I should have said, I'm a follower of Jesus. If Christ has changed my life, he can change yours. And it has very little to do with me being a pastor. So mission, it's understanding it. Secondly, mission is overcoming the obstacles that will come. Let me uh, read quickly, starting in verse number four. Um, and having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. This is entire. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. This is, this is just gripping, folks. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. Paul knows this is over. He's going to Jerusalem, he's going to get beat up, he's going to be imprisoned, he's going to be sent to Rome, he's going to die. When he had finished the voyage, and he'll never see these people again. When he finished the voyage from Tyre, he arrived at Ptolemais. And we greeted the brothers and stayed there within one, one day. And on the next day we departed and came to Caesarea and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own uh, feet and hands and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the one who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem, to overcome the obstacles. The obstacle here wasn't the beating and the suffering he would face in Jerusalem. The, the obstacles were the well-intentioned people who were trying to keep him from fulfilling the mission that God had for him in Jerusalem and beyond. Now, the difficulty comes. You say, well, wait a minute. We've got, we've got the people in Ephesus. We've got the people in Tyre. We've got Philip and his daughters. And now we have Agabus, this prophet who comes from Judea. All of them are warning him and saying, there's trouble ahead. Don't go. Here's the second myth, folks. Many of us believe that suffering and pain are signs that we're not in God's will. Right? I've heard it so many times over the years, somebody say, man, uh, the doctor says I've got cancer. I mean, what did I do wrong? Why is God angry with me? And there may be times, folks, there are times we're a loving God as our Father, according to Hebrews chapter 12, will discipline us because we're in sin. But for, folks, for many times, it's just life. It is life that's hard, as we sang this morning. Sin is broken. The world is broken. And we're, we're walking through this broken world trying to dodge the landmines of pain, not realizing that sometimes pain and suffering are part of God's plan for us. First of all, to develop us and deepen us and, 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 and build in us things we couldn't learn anywhere else and prepare us for ministry. Now, don't get me wrong. I think if, 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 if anybody says, I want pain. Lord, I've had a few days with no uh, obstacles. Could you, could you bring cancer or something into my life, please? That's nuts. But understanding to be on mission 
There will be suffering and there will be pain. And Paul knew it. Now you say, why would he go to Jerusalem? Flip back towards the front of your Bible, one page. I'm reading from chapter 19, verse 21. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem and saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. And so the Holy Spirit is working in Paul's life to move him towards Jerusalem. Now notice in chapter 20, verse 22. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit. Capital S, that's Holy Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me and in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So here's Paul, an apostle, and the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm constraining you to go to Jerusalem. Now along the way, you have people in, um, in, in Tyre who are saying, through the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. You see, how could the Holy Spirit be saying this to Paul and the Holy Spirit saying this through people to Paul? Can the Holy Spirit contradict himself? Correct answer here is no. The Holy Spirit can't contradict himself. And so either one of these is wrong or one of these is being misunderstood. And so every prophecy, in other words, at this time when God would share something with somebody, they had to first of all understand it properly, interpret it properly, and then share it properly. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote the Corinthian believers as well as the believers in Thessalonica and said, make sure that you test everything based on the Word of God. Test everything. And so the obstacles, perhaps were these well-intentioned people who could see what was coming through the Spirit. Agabus says, Paul, give me your belt. Why do you want my belt? Just give me your belt. He takes Paul's belt and he wraps his own hands and his own feet. And he says, the same thing is going to happen to the owner of this belt by the Jews as, he, as they arrest him and hand him over to the Gentiles. Obstacles come. A young couple we have supported for decades and when they were in college, they were followers of Jesus Christ and they wanted to be on mission and they prayed and asked God to give them direction. And they opened up this book that talked about every country of the world and how Christianity had infiltrated the co- that country. And they made the decision um, to uh, go to the least evangelized country in the world. And they chose Turkey based on that. They finished their seminary all working towards getting their languages down so they could do translation work in Turkey. And if all through these years they couldn't go in as missionaries, they had to go in with a job. And he had his job, and all the time he's doing translation work and sharing the gospel with people. And when he lost his job, he was to be kicked out. Uh, he found another job. His wife has been kicked out once, and now in the, in the country of Turkey, they're playing with the idea of making sure that anybody who comes in on this kind of visa has to exit once a month to go back to their country of origin. It's it's impossible. Very, very difficult. Why would people do that? Because of one verse. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. What's Paul going to do? Notice it says, when we heard this, Paul, or Luke is including himself in that. When we heard this, we and the people then urged him not to go to Jerusalem. There will be obstacles. Notice, let's be committed to carrying out whatever God calls us to do. Verse uh, um, 13, when Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since they would not, he would not be persuaded we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. I read those words and my mind goes back to the prayer of Jesus where he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6. But also in Matthew 26, when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and weeping those drops like blood and he's praying and he's saying, Lord, Let this cup of suffering pass from me. 
but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. To do whatever. And he said, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to give it all up. I blogged this week on our Thailand project entitled it From Tears to Tears because the tears of joy we have today of these kids coming to Christ and the villages and people coming to know Jesus and baptisms, tears of joy, but it all started with tears of burden. And tears of burden when they're not followed by an action plan or just emotion is worthless. And it all started with the tears of burden as Daryl Burr shared with me that as a hobby, he goes to Thailand and rescues children. He talked about the, the sex trade in Thailand and how little, these little kids were imprisoned in human trafficking at the age of six, seven, eight, 10, 12 years. It's horrible, just horrible. Daryl has, has been to Thailand over 100 times rescuing little girls. He has in his body diseases that He'll never be the same because of those trips. There were 32 Daryls, all supported by a businessman out of Singapore who wanted these children rescued. Um, last I heard, 30 out of the 32 were either found dead or have not been found. Two remain. Daryl's family is begging him, don't go back to Thailand. You'll be killed. And I don't know if Daryl will or not, but I know Daryl's heart is the same as the words of Paul. I'm ready. I'm ready to go up and suffer. I'm ready to go to die if need be. Two years ago, in, our, in that same Thailand orphanage that, that his vision inspired, five young men, Aka men, came from Laos to visit the Aka orphanage. None of those five knew Jesus. And John's strategy was just to live out Jesus in front of him, and he did. They did. They were to be there for three months, and uh, not long into it, they all came to John and said, we need this Jesus that you have. How do we have Jesus? And he shared with them the gospel, and all five came to know Christ as Savior. When their three months were, were, were up, they went back to, Thailand, or to Laos, the only five Aka believers in the entire country. They started sharing Jesus, and they shared Jesus in an elementary school, and all five were placed in prison. It was, it was not, not easy. They were in prison for three months, and then John was able to come up with money to try to bail them out. When they were asked, I bet you were glad to get out of prison, weren't you? The response of these five Laotian, uh, one, uh, one uh, Thai uh, a person who was in there said no. It was unbelievable to see. We were just building up our prison ministry. <laughs> on mission. On mission. It's who we are. Three of them have since been arrested. Uh, they've all five been thrown out of their village. I would not be a bit surprised in the days ahead, not too far ahead, to hear that one or more of those has lost their lives for the sake of Jesus on mission. Richard Warmbrent, who is the well-known man who suffered so much as a, a preacher of the gospel placed in prison, and he was preaching in prison, and they, the authorities there in Germany said, no, if you preach in prison, we're going to beat you. So I, I heard him speak just before his passing. And he said, we made a deal. I would preach and they would beat me. That was our arrangement. And so he knew that every time he preached, it would be followed by a beating. And he preached and got beaten, preached and got beaten, preached and got beaten. We have to be willing to pay the price. I have so many stories I want to tell you this morning and we're out of time. Mission, you got to understand it. It's who we are. There will be obstacles. Let's deal with them. And let's be willing to do whatever. Mission, the mission God has called me to, and, and probably you too. My mission is easy. 
There are no threats. Nobody's putting me in prison. My mission is easy. And I've thought so often over the years, why is it that that which is so easy is so easily neglected? Let's be on mission. Let's be on mission for the Lord. It's who, he, it's who we are. It's who we are. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. By the way, East, isn't Easter a wonderful time for mission? There's many people, uh, even religious lost, and uh, are thinking about being in church somewhere Easter. Uh, how about if, uh, are you open for a challenge today? Could somebody say yes? Um, somebody. My wife's not in this service. Normally she would. Uh, here's a challenge. How about invite? What's a good number? Two? Anybody with more faith? <laughs> um, let's do two. Okay? Invite two people to join you on Easter weekend. And some of you may want to even do four. Okay? By the way, let's close. Um, just remember there'll be people at the close of the service, every service up here. If you need somebody to pray with, um, Every week we go through the struggles, don't we? And if you need somebody to pray with you, we're here. We love you. We really do. And we're in this journey together. Let's help each other. Come on up afterwards. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for commissioning us and empowering us to be in this incredible mission for Jesus. And Father, I pray that you'll protect us and bless us and use us this week for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you folks. You are dismissed and have a wonderful, wonderful week in Christ.